everybody. <laughs> Welcome. I love that right away we can get into a powerful lesson. And the powerful lesson we've already seen is, what can you do to grab people's attention? Think of a teacher you really liked, whether it's here or a previous school, that greeted you at the door by name. The math teacher that already had a problem on the board, but also had a twist of humor to it. Maybe using math humor, like my friend Dave Graham, his nickname was Orange, would always have a math joke of the day. When you have a project worth over 30% of your mark in 11th grade, and your project is the history of music over time, this subject was called Society, Challenge, and Change. Back in our day, it was called Man in Society. Then they realized there were women in society and changed the name of that program. So I thought, what can I do, as somebody a little younger than some of you, to grab people's attention? So as soon as they walked into this classroom, doing a project worth 25% of my mark, the, po the uh, room was decorated in a celebration of big music of the time. The year was 1987. They saw Metallica ride the lightning poster. They saw a U2 Joshua Tree poster. They saw a Madonna True Blue poster, you know? And then there was an overhead question with overhead. That was the PowerPoint of 1987. <laughs> with some music trivia questions. And I even had a prize giving away a mixed, a blank cassette where you can make a mixed cassette for your loved one. That's right, before playlists, Charlotte's, we would give our woman a mixed tape. What can you do to right away grab people? There's so many different ways, and I appreciate you all jumping in with my trivia contest. Or as you see, some other ones I'll use throughout the course of the session. Welcome, everybody, to my session called Let's Talk. Where did I get this? Thank you. As Jessica, uh, why am I drawing a blank? I have no idea, right? Well, uh, Charlotte, exactly. And I'm also here to tell you, we're going to talk about names in a second. We're going to talk about names in a second. I get bombarded with a lot of names, and we're going to talk about it in a second. Bedry, right? So, what I've learned is sometimes I do run into somebody, Jen and Jackie, that I draw a blank on their names. Why that's happening to you, I don't know. So what more time, what is it? Heather. It's Heather, time. I know. <laughs> Why? Heather, 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 Heather. So Heather highlighted a little bit about my background as to why I talk about communication. Not that I'm a communication expert, it's just that I enjoy it. And I don't mind screwing up in my communication because I continue to learn as a 50-year-old. And I hope that even this mini interaction right here reminds all of you that the key to getting better with names is to ask for their name again with courage. Right, Heather? Because then something happens. You just don't forget again. Your brain goes, come on. Come on. From Jamaica, right? Come on. You start remembering enough from Turkey. Come on. Kitchener Collegiate. Oh, wait. You weren't Waterloo Collegiate. No, you were Woodstock Collegiate. There we go. Take me a second. You start making those communication connections where you build rapport with people, and then rapport creates conversation, right? Oh, I was just in Woodstock, chatting with somebody just earlier. I'm going, to I'm going to go to Waterloo Collegiate in April. Or if I don't know about, oh, what part of Turkey are you from? Let's pull that up on the greatest app we all have called Google Maps, so I can learn where you're part of New York, you're part of Turkey. Where's Baden? Where did anybody tell me where Baden is, right? But we can tell you where Baden is, New Hamburg, Punky Doodles Corners, I've been there too. My favorite name for a town, by the way, in all of Canada, Punky Doodles Corners, just outside of Baden, and some people know where that is. My friend Jeff Gerber is from there. So a little bit about myself. Born and raised, still live in beautiful London, Ontario, where I went to Laurier Secondary School, student president, ran orientation week at King's College, University of Western Ontario. I don't know why they named me most spirited graduate, but I'll give you a bit of a hint. Western, well, purple and proud. Everybody looks good in purple. I've been doing this since 1992 as a full-time job. In two weeks, I'll celebrate the 20th anniversary of my first ever motivational talk. I was paid $75 to spend a morning at a high school in London. Sorry, CRA, I never did claim that $75. I didn't think I'd make another dime. I never did, never did. 
It's been my full-time living since I was 28. Started when I was your age, college age students, age 18 to 22. But of course, I have to adjust that now because you know the average age of college student in, in, in now in Ontario is 26. Right? University, it's 1920, but for college, it's 26. And the diversity of ages in this room reflects that. Awesome. As I say to people, my brother-in-law started Fanshawe College the same day as his 19-year-old daughter. Right? Because for him, he wanted to get re-educated, in his case, computers, and as he started school the same day as his daughter. That's the great thing about the college system. Give Conestoga and our great colleges a great round of applause. It's awesome. <laughs> my favorite titles are husband, give me an awe on three, one, two, three. Aww. Dad, give me an awe on three, one, two, three. Aww. I know we have a newer mom in the room over here. Yeah, she's got to tear up just talking about her little boy. So cute. I'll be home soon. Mommy will be home soon. And my daughters are now grade nine at my old high school. As a school spirit guy, to have your grade nine daughter sleep in a t-shirt with your high school logo on it. Oh, yes. <laughs> Nicholas Wilson Warriors, Laurier Rams, Western Mustangs, you got it. And my daughter's in grade six at my old elementary school. I commented on your gorgeous hair, my friend from Jamaica. What's your first name? I'm Tamara. Tamara. Tamara, love it. So Tamara, when you sit in a room with African young ladies as they create their hair and you appreciate the attention to detail, the hours, the nimbleness of fingers. My two eldest nieces, because they call me Uncle Andrew, which in African culture is just the ultimate compliment. I get to walk them down the aisle when they get married. <laughs> when you have three young ladies from Congo live with you for 10 months because the, their dad's house was just too small. But we, he had waited eight years to see them. Imagine not seeing your kids for eight years. Wow. That's what happens when you, when you have to flee the corruption, which is Congo. And the blessing is all mine. You know, they keep on calling me their Canadian angel. I said, no, no, you're the angels in my life. And this past weekend, they ran a 50th birthday party for me, doing all the decorations, doing the food. I love Congolese food so much. And, uh, but you also can tell they're teenagers. That's us waiting for our school bus, and they're always running late. So they eat the cereal in the car. That's their last day that I drove them. They were with me for 10 months. They now live in another home, but still a big part of my life. So uh, I, I just wanted to say I, I know the effort hair takes <laughs> and how difficult all of it is to put in a Canadian toque. <laughs> they never wore a hat in their life. And then they arrive on a minus 18 day in November of <laughs> 2018. Where do we put all this hair? Rochelle initially tried to push it up. She kind of looked like a cone head. She decided not to do that again. I think it looks actually really cute when it comes down like this, and then they have the toque, and it looks adorable. Goodbye, Wonka hat. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, I love playing tennis. I'm into my Western Mustangs football, which won the national championship in 2017. That's a picture from Sportsnet. And uh, that crazy hat is why my wife won't go to the games with me. And, uh, but I have retired the crazy hat, because now that we finally won the national championship, I have retired the hat. And thanks to Stranger Things, a lot of people now are aware of a game called Dungeons and Dragons. I play with my daughters and her friends, and it's a great way to interact without screens and play with Lego, just like I did when I was 11 years old. Nice. <laughs> so, I'm now gonna switch over here to the other part of my program. Just give me one moment here. There we go. Was that it here? Yeah. There we go. Aha. So I looked a little different when I started high school. Give me an awe on three, one, two, three. <laughs> so there I am. I too was raised a good Catholic boy. That's First Communion, 1984. I started, um, Confirmation, grade eight, yes, you got it. Communion was, of course, grade two, grade three, and confirmation. My sister doesn't like this picture. Why am I not in the picture? Nancy, you took the picture. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Selfies were invented in 1983. And, uh, and there I am, my Dungeons and Dragons group, at the same time that Stranger Things was big, set in 1984. My favorite sport in grade nine was football. As you can tell in high school, I played football. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, what were you, Andy? Starting left back? 
Left back in the dressing room? <laughs> Shut it. To my friends not familiar with the sport of football, there's positions in football, quarterback, running back, defensive back, get it? I was left back in the dressing room. <laughs> and now some friends not growing up with football, or football is your soccer, like my Congolese nieces, yes, got it. So when you're six foot in grade six, and you're playing football on the playground of your elementary school, you are often picked first, second, third with this type of height. Because I could block passes, I could catch passes, get low the size of my legs, they call me Cheetah Boy running all over the place. Okay, fine, I called myself Cheetah Boy, fine. I didn't like the nickname Skinny Ginger, okay? <laughs> Shut it. I, mean, I had the moves. I was always picked first. When it came to football in grade seven and grade eight, I was the man. It's hard to be the man when you're laughing at me. Stop it. By the way, to be the man, don't whine like that either. Stop it. Then came grade eight, right? Grade eight was my favorite year of school so far. My first year on student council, vice president of my elementary school. I won the election because nobody ran against me. <laughs> Second year on track and field. Why? Because when you're six foot in grade eight doing the hurdles was completely hilarious. I could walk and go over hurdles at the same time. And I was playing football every day with my buddies because my favorite team the Los Angeles Raiders, then Oakland Raiders, and as of two weeks ago, the Las Vegas Raiders were my favorite team. They had won the Super Bowl that year. They've not won it since, or even been good for like 50, 20 years. Grade eight was awesome. And then we got the tour, the tour of our high school, Laurier Secondary School there in London, home of the Rams. And they talked about getting involved. And as I stood there, as a wide-eyed April grade eight kid, remember when you got your high school tour? And I just nod along. When they talk about getting involved, I'm gonna get involved. I'm definitely gonna get involved in student council. All being involved in student council in grade eight had me sitting beside people like Matt and Greg, because these guys were cool, right? They talked to girls on the phone, right? They could dance. They knew about Prince and Michael Jackson, right? They, they were cool. But I was also sitting beside Don, Sherry, Pam, like it was a great way to meet people. I'm definitely gonna do student council in high school. I'm definitely gonna do track and field. What I love about track and field was that guys, girls in all five grades back in those days, we had grade 13, could be on the team at the same time. Basketball doesn't have that, hockey doesn't have that. Only in track and field can you be a grade nine boy and get on the bus and sit beside a grade 12 girl. <laughs> definitely gonna do track and field in high school. And besides, just for me, especially for me, there's no cuts in track and field. <laughs> of course, I'm going to get involved in the classroom. But the big thing I want to get involved with, what sport, everybody? Football. football. So first day of high school, I get on my gym equipment, go try it for football. Whoa. Now, I was this tall when I was in grade nine. But I was over 25 pounds lighter than I am today. Now, some of you right now are looking at me going, um, Andy, there's not a whole lot of you going on right now, man. Your back pockets fight for space back there. You're the only person we know that has to buy a 32 waist. I have to get 32 because I, I, I need the length, and I have a serious belt action here going on. Yes, my wife and my Congolese nieces hate it, though Dedeen is built like me as well where she struggles with pant legs, right? She, her waist is so thin and her pants always go to here. We call, she learned a new word called caprice. <laughs> so if you thought I was slim now, when I was in grade nine, I was six foot, 118 pounds. My number one enemy in grade nine, the wind. <laughs> now I can laugh about it now because I've really filled out. I'm a strapping 144 now which means I'm 16 pounds underweight for a six foot woman. <laughs> that is true, by the way. That joke courtesy of my doctor, by the way, about 10 years ago. I said, physical, how am I doing? Oh, you're, you're 15 pounds underweight for a six foot woman. That's a good line. <laughs> I try out for football the first day of grade nine. 
And you might not be surprised, but I was. When it wrapped up, and the coach called everybody together, okay, too many of you. We're going to make three cuts. Tonight's the first cut. Check the list tomorrow. See if you can get invited to tomorrow night's practice. And many of you have been there before, right? The opportunity to try out for something. You've applied for something. You're singing for, performing for, a, a spot in a play, musical, a spot on a team, a spot on a travel competitive team. You're waiting for the call. You're waiting for the list. You've been there. And it's nerve wracking. And the next day, the list goes up for the first round of cuts. And some people walk away happy. And some people walk away mad. <laughs> and I went something like this. All right, we're looking for Andy Thibodeau. We're looking. Still looking for Andy Thibodeau. Is there another list? Oh. And it wasn't as if anybody said anything to me, right? We've all seen the stereotypical scene from an episode of Glee, High School the Musical, any movie set in high school, first movie I ever took my daughter to, Chipmunks the Squeakle. <laughs> and if you've seen it, it's full of every high school stereotype. May I review for you, Heather? Here they go. Football players are dumb and they pick on people. Do you know that stereotype? Cheerleaders are ditzy and they hang out with the football players because they're just so cute. And music drama kids, you must bound together there at, Kingston, at, at Kitchener Collegiate where you music and drama kids go in your beautiful theater that's 100 years old where you understand Rodgers and Hammerstein. You understand the power of Wicked. You have Hamilton memorized and these football players don't understand. They don't understand how powerful the song It's Quiet Uptown is. One of the most powerful songs ever. When I hear Remember Me from Coco, I think of my dad. When I see the end of Toy Story 3 and he's off to college, right? Reminding us all the power of music. And then you meet the football player who got an academic scholarship to Western who married the violinist. <laughs> and that when I got cut from football, even though it was the bad old 80s, it was 84, Nav was right, jokes with the n-word, my sister being called retarded because she was in a special needs class. He's right. When you're 50, you look back at 1982 and go, <sighs> <laughs> Can you believe? I know. But I'm also here to pe tell you, people, people change, you know. There's lots of people who are in the 70s who thought certain things in 62. And then they look at my Congolese nieces when I took them to the football game. This one wonderful man in his 80s. As the game ended, it was an exciting game. He just said to them, boy, did you guys ever pick a great game to see your first game ever? Did you have fun? And they did, and they chatted with him for a bit. And just at one point, I locked eyes with that guy, and I just said, because it was nice. It was obvious. It was their first game. I'm here to tell you that when I got cut from football, nobody pointed at me. Nobody said, hey, hey. You know, nobody tripped me, and I fell, and my books went all over the place. You've seen that. My number one person making fun of me was me. When I got cut from football on the second day of high school, I was like, oh, what was I thinking? I thought I was good, but I'm skinny. Why did I even bother? So a week later, when my friends didn't want to go to the student council meeting, I didn't go. Student council vice president three months earlier, three months later because I felt stupid, like a failure, I didn't go to the meeting. Year later, didn't try out for football. But Andy, you could try out again, man. Michael Jordan was cut from the basketball team, but he played junior varsity, Andy, and then he tried out again the next year, because that's the great thing about high school. You have four or five years to try out again. You should have tried out again, to which I say to high school kids, yes, I wish I did. And it wasn't until the cuts were done in grade 10, and I saw the people that made the team, I should have tried out. So men, over 25 years ago, a kid asked me, hey Andy, if you could do high school all over again, but only change one decision, 
what one decision would change? And like that, I said, oh, I'd go back to first day of grade 10. Oh, why is that? Uh, I, I'm a big football fan, and I, I got cut from the football team in grade 9. And I didn't make it, so in grade 10, instead of thinking, oh, I could try it again, I said, why bother? And as I was telling this story to this kid, and I'm just a little older than you, I'm the same, same age as some of you, I was 25. As I started telling the story, I realized, I gotta start telling kids this story. Because I just I watched the kids kind of lean in as I told this story of failure, feeling like a, like a screw up. And that's when the professional speaker at 25 learned another thing about professional speaking and communicating with people. When you wear your heart in your sleeve, tell a genuine story, people start to lean in. And I told a 30 second version of the story, but just a second ago, I told you a 10 minute version of the story that had you both laughing and thinking. But the first time I told that story, it was 30 seconds. Now I can tell it so it's 10, 10 minutes, I can actually click it all the way to 15. I can make it the centerpiece of a half an hour and pull three ideas off it. You've seen the TED Talks and you thought, how do they do it? They do it because they've done it so many times and then they make it better each time. And I've been telling that story since 1995. And we're going to take that story, take it apart, and pull some lessons out for you to help you communicate better. Can everybody stand up for a second and stretch it out? All right. So with Heather's help, and uh, anybody else's help, we're going to hand out the handout to those who didn't get the handouts previously. So there we go. And maybe Jackie may be going up and down this way. Uh, you already got one. I know it comes. There we go. And we'll be working on the side called Let's Talk Effective Communication. And here we go. So sometimes communication. Take a second to hand that out. Everybody's got one. It's getting there. Great. Awesome. So this activity is called, now you can set the paper down because I need your help for a second. And we'll reference the paper over the course of the next little bit. This activity is called Ooh Ah Orchestra. Now I would stand, but there's wheels on those chairs, so I'll, uh, I'll just go from here. Ooh Ah Orchestra. This half you are ooh. One, two, three. Ooh. This side you are ah. One, two, three. Ah. So. Ah. Meet. Ooh. And ooh. this is. Now we all know each other, let's have some fun. Okay. Now if I hold it long, you hold it long, so... Ooh. Ah. Nice. <laughs> and if I'm quick, you're quick, so... So I am Maestro Andy. <laughs> this is the Conestoga, sponsored by CSI Philharmonic. And this is... Orchestra. <laughs> Here we go. Excuse me. Tap, tap, tap. Music kids love this. We're warmed up. Here we go. A little faster. Well done. Let's bust it out. Let's do a classic beat from 1977. Buddy, you're a boy, make a big noise, screaming in the streets, gonna be a big man someday. You got mud on your face, big disgrace, waving your banner all over the place, singing, We will, we will rock you. We will, we will rock you. Well done, give yourselves a round of applause, have a seat. Well done. Excellent.
Aha! There's my water bottle. You will see in a bit why I told that story the way I did and how that ties in. Next lesson about communication. Many years ago when I did my first long workshop, as I was telling the people in the first session this morning, my first long workshop was a two hour program in a university gym in Kamloops in 1994. Back in those days I traveled with a guy named Stu Saunders, we were Andy and Stu, and our mentor named Mark was in the audience. Mark, who we saw first day of grade nine as a movie. So this guy had a movie 12 years before this period that I'm interacting with him. He's out of Minnesota. He's being paid more money than we are, a lot more money to be doing the same thing we're doing. And he takes in our presentation. And afterwards he says, Andy, it was great. Stu, well done. But after a half an hour, I started getting a little uncomfortable. 45 minutes, I stood up and stood along the side of the wall watching your session. At an hour and a half, you could tell that the crowd was getting uncomfortable because they were still sitting on a gym bleacher. How many of you have been there? At a university there in Kamloops. So he gave me an insight that I've learned since, that I've, I've been able to use since. The insight is, Andy and Stu, the mind takes in what the bum can contain. And when especially you're on a plastic chair, wood bleachers, you're working with elementary school kids on a gym floor, get them up, get them the stretch. You know how you feel when you are given a break at the hour mark to go take a walk, refocus. So you'll see when I do my programs, about every 20 minutes, I do something that encourages standing and reminds every one of you, if you have to run a longer session, what can you do to have break time for discussion? Break time for just the sake of break time? Or maybe a simple activity like an ooh-ah orchestra. In the morning I taught dexterity check. We can do a trivia game. We can do a get to know you game, which I'll do in a second. The stand up sit down, which we did this morning, remember? Right? What icebreakers can you incorporate in your longer sessions? And I don't just do this with grade fives. I do this with people of all ages. When I did a two-hour retreat for the Greater Toronto Hockey League, their staff, and the average age of that staff was 45, I did the ooh-ah, I did the dexterity check, I did a game that involves counting fingers. So in the next lesson for you is breaking up your presentation. You know that good professors, good teachers do this, you can do it too. So, I'm a dad, and when you are a child, and we all were once a child, we had no limits on how we communicated with the world. There you were. Right? That's me. <laughs> when you were happy as a child, did the world know? Yes. You laughed your ass off. You laughed so hard. Even if it was right in the middle of the place of worship, right? Funeral. There was no filter, right? You laughed. But if you were sad, did the world know? Oh, yes. You're willing to cry. Mom, Dad came home from school to say, this upset me. Angry. Things not going your way. Did you express that? Yeah. No limits on how we communicated. But something starts to happen as we hit grade three into grade five. Not because the world is evil. Not because people around us want to suppress us. But we start to learn as human beings different ways that we now have to limit the way we share our emotions, share our story with the world. Happy, sad, frustrated, angry, excited. Think of Nav, who was our speaker this morning, that fine line that I also have to walk of Modesty with shameless self-promotion. Correct? 
If he's going to make the money to support the charities that are important to him, plus sell vehicles and take thousands of kids to Raptors games, and that's not free, contrary to also his cultural belief of modesty, or my belief as a speaker that I want to share what I'm all about, at the same time promote it so I can get another gig next week. <laughs> I understand his challenges, right? And it's a challenging thing as a communicator of any type that I'm passionate about something, but not in disrespect of what you're passionate about, or to come across as too over the top. But it's that word modesty, and in fact, it was that word bragging, was one of the first ways a little bit of my communication got limited. I'm really excited I got a good mark on this test. And somebody says, stop bragging. And a little part of your brain goes, there's certain people I'll now tell them about the test, mom, but maybe not the guy sitting beside me in math class who got 62. And just a little bit of how we communicate. Now again, some of it's maturity, right? Maybe I was bragging, maybe I was overdoing it, maybe I have to learn. But when I say that, what sort of statements were said to you or you experienced that started to maybe just a little bit limit how you shared with the world. And I'll give you two examples to get, to get you thinking. One was don't brag. And growing up in the 70s, as a man, no matter what happens, even if you're sliding into home plate and you get the home run, but you've lost also half your leg, <laughs> big boys don't what, everybody? You got it. Also a famous song by The Cure from the 80s, Boys Don't Cry. Or, stop acting like such a baby. baby. <laughs> what other statements? Just did some, maybe limited the way you communicated. Any others that came to your? Well, for me it was what my parents saying, not like some people might just be being nice or they might not actually be interested in what you're talking about. So your parents saying they, that I, people aren't interested, that, that, they're, that they're, they're not interested, okay. That they're just being nice and listening to just be nice, that they don't okay. actually want to hear what I have to say. Got it, yes, I see what you're saying, right. So then now you're, you're thinking to yourself, are they just being nice or are they actually interested? That's a, that's a weird thing to play with in your brain. Well done, Cameron. Yes. Oh. I actually have a story. Um, back in high school, I actually got told by my guidance counselor, you can't go to college because you're not smart enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. That person was a guidance counselor? Yep. <laughs> um, His name I, is Mr. Uh, Rodstake. I think I'd be like... You need to find a new career. <laughs> what guidance counselor so would So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my college diploma when I'm done and I'm going to go back and say you said I couldn't do it. I just yeah. did it. Yeah. You got it. In a high road sort of way, great lesson from this morning as well. That's why I love coming to these sessions. I enjoy these programs. Well done. Well done. Thanks for sharing. What else? Um, it's rude to ask for what you want. Right. 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 Just, I'll just play rude to ask, but I don't know what you're saying, right? Can I have a second cookie, right? Can I have the job? You know, do you want to buy this? I'm not making this up. The key to sales is the clothes, right? The classic do you want fries with that is called upsale, and it works. It works. Oh, you need some dessert, right? Montana's, Kelsey's, they come back. You want some dessert, right? Like even asking for a piece of gum, or like, can I have some? Yeah, can I have? Yes. Like there was a time when I was volunteering at Habitat for Humanity, and like someone was donating something. They had a thing of like orange Gina, and then like trunk and asked if I could. So that thing, they gave me the whole thing. <laughs> we had a whole thing of orange Gina. Because you had the courage to ask. <laughs> 
at the time, I called it Orange China. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, yeah, Orange China. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Hang on, yeah. Grow up. Grow up. Whoa, that's a big one. Grow up. Now, again, I'm not saying there's a part and an element of maturity to this, but what starts to happen is how we expressed ourselves got a little limited, right? And so that the me that was here and expressive now becomes maybe something a lot smaller. This, like I'm not even putting a limit on it. This becomes a lot smaller. And then I watch shy seventh graders not run for a position on student council. Why? You've all heard it. I don't want to give a speech. I don't want to stand in front of my class. Or when they do give a talk, I'm talking to you today about the sun. The sun is big and yellow. And you watch somebody else go, I chose the sun today because I was always fascinated by astronomy. And you see the difference. A person that uses words like I and my and looks up with confidence, right? And that when we can reclaim what we used to have and share stories with confidence, be confident looking people in the eye, confident with pauses, another common trait with bad communicators, too fast, right? They're too fast. Get me off the stage. What I have to share is not interesting. What's exciting about the next few minutes, I like to think, is I want to show you how to reclaim what you already have. And while we're in such variance of communication skills in this room, because some of you out there have literally been working professionals for 10 years, 15 years, 30 years, some are parents and some are 19, we have a lot of variance in this room, but all of us deal with this in a bit. And as you can see, how I've been able to reclaim is share my story with enthusiasm, take what was initially 30 seconds, extend it to 10 minutes of truth with some humor. When you do that, you realize that in fact, what is the root challenge for all of us to truly share what we enjoy and what's important to us. What is that key English word? It's four letters and starts with an F and it's not that word. What is that word that limits us to truly share who we are? And it starts with F and it's fear. fear. And we can summarize our inability or not a lack of eagerness to share, not fear of our inability to speak English, but fear of what? What do we fear when we give our opinion in class, give our opinion amongst a circle of friends, give our opinion to family, share our story, the classic lull in the conversation after somebody just told a good one about their weekend and you wanna say, well, you know what happened to me on this weekend? You know what happened to me? And it's a louder party, it's a social setting, English is your third language. What are you thinking when you feel fear, Cameron? Rejection. Whoa. That's the big one we'll come back to. Whether it's your story, your idea, your opinion. What's another thing you fear? Huh? Judgment. Ju judgment? Judgment, yes, judge or being judged. And of course, not positive judgment, but negative, right? Right? They're not going to enjoy my story. Let me, let me get through this. Being ignored. Ignored, oh, even what? Oh, you know, what's worse than these two things? Being ignored in some ways, right? Not even being there. Being misunderstood. Misunderstood, oh, right? What else? Yes. You're not educated enough or whatever. Not educated. You're you're you don't understand, right? Not educated. What else do we fear when we actually feel fear about communicating who we are? Um, also like offending someone unintentionally too. Oh. Please remind me about how my Congolese nieces are reminding me that sometimes there's political correctness and they're all for it. 
as I went to four Black History Month events of them last year. They're all for appreciation of diversity, but they also think I tread too lightly, right? I, I know what it was. Magali, their 16-year-old sister, Bainey, the 22-year-old, are interested in taking math and engineering in university. There was my minister's daughter, who's taking her PhD in engineering, was speaking at her church lunch, and it was going to be $10. And so somebody had said to me, which of the two is taking math in university again? I said, Magali and Bainey. Here's $20. Tell them that the lunch is for free. Got it. And then I go to them, but the other two sisters, Rochelle, interested in architecture, Dedeen, interested in business, were right there. And I said, hey, Magdalene, hey, Bainey, an angel from the church wants to pay for you for your lunch. Rochelle, Dedeen, I'm sorry. And they did it again. They said, Uncle Andrew, quit doing that. You don't offend us when you include in our sisters. We know why you have asked them. They are interested in math and engineering. We're not. Stop doing that. Yeah, now I've gotten too politically correct. It's because I told a story about liking a girl and being interested in girls in grade seven and like 15 years ago, a teacher said, well, you should include a way that sometimes a guy could also be interested in another guy. You should do that. You know, I'm the lead of the GSA and I listened to her and I was like, but, but that's my story. And how do I even drop that in there without offending GSA people? Or unless you're a guy and you're into a guy. How do I even drop that in there without being kind of flippant about it? And, you know, believe me, I have a daughter in the GSA. It's my story. My story shouldn't offend you. You gotta pick. So I appreciate that insight, right? We're afraid of offense. Right? Right? These are great. These are insightful. Powerful. So in other words, if I want you to reclaim what you already had, what I need to help you work on is your fear, rejection, offending somebody, being ignored, being misunderstood. You don't have the education or the background to do this. And that is why some of you don't look forward to doing what I'm about to do. Don't look forward to giving your opinion or circle of friends. In this day and age where the world is at our colleges and we look at some political leaders who do a lot of talking on behalf of our country, our province, or America, and we think, is this the best we can do? We need people like you that have the courage to say, no, this is what I think. And here's some ideas to make it better going forward. That's what we want. We want people to have the courage to fight their fear and share their story. Because one more time, there's a time in my life, I wouldn't do that in front of people. But whether you're entertaining grade twos or entertaining your room of college kids, this is why I don't have that fear anymore. Yeah, I just was watching Chappelle again, and where he was doing that whole bit about how good he is. Right? He says, I'm just so darn good at this. He said, I can write out a punchline and throw it in a bowl, pull out a punchline, and come up with a joke. I won't tell you the one he uses, but some of you have seen that, sh that, that, that special. But he says it's part of his courage. It's part of his confidence. He goes out literally thinking, I'm going to knock this out of the park. The key to fighting your fear of what I call, and I think you all call it, maybe the same different version, self-disclosure. That is our fear. We fear self-disclosure using I, my, your opinion, your story, your good enough. That is the root of fear. That your sharing of your story using I and my, your opinion, and the fact you're good enough is what we truly fear. And the key to getting better at self-disclosure is, drum roll, You may stop. More self-disclosure. And while that seems so staggeringly basic, and you're thinking, we're at the halfway point and that's what this is, <laughs> it's the truth. The key to being better at self-disclosure 
is doing more self-disclosure. And my entire career changed in 1995 when a grade eight said, if you got to do high school all over again, what would you do differently if you could change one decision? I started talking about first day of high school, getting cut from football, saw how the kids got interested, thought, I'm gonna start telling a story about failure. And holy cow, I've told the story of failure, getting cut from football so many times, and I get nods of acknowledgement and not sneers of rejection. What does self-disclosure do for your presentations? Let me show you. It does three amazing rewards. The first, reaction in audience. So I open up on purpose with my presentation, telling you a bit about my story and trying out for football on the first day of grade nine. And think about it even culturally, where one third of this audience has little familiarity with the sport of Canadian American football, but I still told it anyhow, because it's my story. Don't apologize for it. Nav's story is his story. I wasn't there in 1984, and neither were you, but I still enjoyed his presentation. So many lessons that you can all take from today. When I started sharing my story about getting cut from football, ties into my nieces, ties into Toy Story and music and Uptown, it's quiet Uptown. How did you feel as I shared these stories? How did you feel as I shared those experiences? How do you share, feel as you saw some images of my life and I on purpose show you pictures of that young man battling rejection, and self-confidence. How did you feel as I told, told that story? Give me some examples. This is not just me fishing for compliments, but I'm looking for my point. Yes? Well, I feel like it's a similar connection with how I was growing up. Like, not exactly a one-to-one -one sort of thing, but a lot of similar kind of stuff. So, so connection, uh, feeling similar, similar, right? Yeah. Like thinking back on my childhood. Thinking back. What else? Yes. Relate. Relate. What else? Inspiring. Inspiring. What else? There's so much honesty in the story that anyone would, you know, relate to. Honesty, and then powerfully back to the word relate. Wonderful. I think you try to make everyone understand somewhat about what the sport is, so you don't feel left out. Oh. You don't know anything about it. Right. I helped you understand, and thus don't feel left out. Nice. Let's be honest. Anybody else be honest? Here we go. How many here in one Raptors game in the spring in turn watch more Raptors in one game than you ever had previous? Anybody like me? Exactly. And then you end up watching a lot of games and then something happened, right? And then there's Nav who you can't totally relate to because that's a lot of basketball he's watched, right? But still, I now understand basketball better. Thanks to Nav. Thanks for watching. Anything else? And one more. Yep. Uh, I was entertained. I think... Uh and this is where as a speaker and as a workshop leader I have what you call your boom moment because look at the visual you have now in front of you if you want to take a picture before you leave please do because the next time you want to give your opinion and you think ah maybe not share your story you think ah maybe not and decide you're going to open up your classroom presentation with, I chose this topic because I like something about this and weave a bit of what was you were passionate about throughout your presentation, whatever your topic is. Because I've met already those of you doing uh, the, the law and security and the uh, investigation to those of you taking the business and international business. When you are giving your story, when you are giving your opinion, 
You think you're going to be rejected, judged, ignored, misunderstood, not educated, and offending people. Yet I just did this in front of a mixed audience of all ages and all races, and you thought I was connecting with you, thinking back in, in a positive way, relating to you, inspiring to you, honesty, helping you understand, entertained. You gotta change your perception of how you think about you. You think that, well that is happening. But Andy, I had this time where somebody didn't understand me and I'm thinking about it every day the rest of my life. You're right. 5% of people in life will give you that. And they'll be loud and they'll be in your face and you'll never forget it. But 95% of people think this. And they're often quiet and they nod appreciatively as you have the courage to be you. The first person to start a GSA. The first person to say, why don't we make February Black History Month? The first person to say, let's have National Hijab Day. Boom, 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 right? Nav in 1995. 1984. Boom! Right? Darn right he heard this. And now he's living this. But he was living this. He sold 150 cars in three months. Right? He turned off the loud and listened to the quiet. Who then went and recommended him. And not just in the South Asian community, in any community he was selling to. Right? I hope that inspires you right there. So, as an example, I say to my daughter, last year, you're studying the St. Louis. That ship that departed from Europe, full of Jews, fleeing Nazis, I was turned away by Cuba, turned away by America, turned away by Canada, and went back. And they were, had to pick something about the story that grabbed them, and she picked the captain. And she had to draw, she decided to draw a picture of the captain, because she felt for the captain. He tried to do the right thing. He knew what would happen. It's a, it's a black mark on Canada's legacy. The story of the St. Louis, the ship full of Jewish refugees that got turned back. I, I, well, you know. And I said to my daughter, how you open your presentation in front of your grade 8 class is why you chose the captain, why you chose to draw him. Because she had eloquently said to me what it was about him, that he was torn, like, like he was German, but he knew this was wrong, the Holocaust was wrong, he was trying to help, and he was just like, he wanted to scream from his top of line, would you let me let these people off? You have no idea what's waiting for them back in Germany. And I said that, and when she got such an outstanding mark, right, it's because right away by telling a bit of why this story from 60, 70 years ago grabbed her heart, and why in particular this man's conflict grabbed her heart. She had the room nodding. She had Madame Burry going, yes, yes. Weave you into your presentations, whether it's something formal that you're marked on, or afterwards sharing out there before the meal why you enjoyed this, why you enjoyed something else. What are you gonna be doing this weekend as part of your life? Tell us your story because you get a fantastic reaction in audience. Everybody stand up for a second, stretch it out. Awesome. Now I need your help. As you know, we have many different languages and cultures in this room. Um, so my, uh, my wife, Pa Francais, she has your typical French teacher background. Her parents are from Scotland. Um, <laughs> I'm the one with French grandparents. My last name is Thibodeau. My ancestors arrived in Canada in 1651. Pierre, and we actually have a plaque to him. There's a plaque in Nova Scotia to Pierre Thibodeau. Um, my nieces, as I said, are from Africa. They grew up speaking Swahili and French. They moved to uh, Kinshasa. They learned Lingala, and they identify with Serge Ibaka of the Raptors. 
because Serge Ibaka's first two languages are Lingala and French, while Pascal Siakam is uh, French uh, African himself as well. What languages do we have out there? Here's what I need your help with. I need five volunteers that need to be able to say the numbers 1 to 18 in a language that's not French or English. I want to see the diversity of languages here. You need to be able to say the numbers 1 to 18 in a language that's not as French or English. Can I get some volunteers? What language will you give me? Hindi. Hindi. So one Hindi. Come on up here. What language will you give me? Kujarati? Come on up. I'll get that property. What language are you going to give me? Sign language. Oh, sign language. Fantastic. Come over here. Fourth one. Kurdish. Kurdish. And a fifth one. Punjabi. Punjabi. Got it. Give our volunteers a nice round of applause. <laughs> All right. So the first name again was? Angelica. Angelica? Yeah. And uh, yes. And what language are you going to give us? Hindi. Hindi. Got it. Uh, so, uh, aloo? Thanks. Chips. <laughs> right? Potato fries? Yeah. yeah good. Got it. Uh, next, your first name again was? Tamara. Tamara. Uh, Tamara. And you're going to give us uh, sign, language. sign language. Fantastic. Next we have? Amina. Amina. And you're going to give us? Kurdish. Kurdish. Wonderful. Next we have? Shamshir. Sh Shamshir. That's right. And you're going to give us? Punjabi. Punjabi. And finally we have? Jainil. Yep. And Gujarati language. Got it. And uh, three are from South Asia. Am I correct? Yeah. Oh, got it. My understanding is English, uh, India has about 25-ish official languages. Yeah, more than 28, got it, got it, many, many different. While uh, uh, Kurdish, uh, a bit of uh, Turkey, a bit of Iraq, a bit of Afghanistan, Kurdistan, yeah. all from that area, wonderful, fascinating, and then sign language, fantastic. So this activity is called 18 Wheels on a Big Rig. So the chorus line is 18 Wheels on a Big Rig. Everybody? 18 Wheels on a Big Rig. And they're rolling, 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 rolling. A big rig is a big truck, right? 18 wheels and a big rig, and they're rolling, 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 rolling. The verses are the numbers 1 to 18. We're going to do, another, we're going to do another numbers 1 to 18 in English four different ways. We're going to do French together, those of you who can. Then I'll point at each one of you five. Do 1 to 18 in your language, proudly and loudly. Both a part of our be who you are, be proud of who you are, but at the same time so we can all learn and understand just within even one subcontinent, how you can say one or ten, so very different. Well, the rest of us appreciate it. Once they are done and hit 18, we then all jump in with the chorus line. Wheels on a big rig and they're rolling, 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 rolling. Okay? So the game is called 18 Wheels on a Big Rig and they're rolling, 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 rolling. Uh, again, you only have to do it once going up. We'll do English four different ways once going up, so don't freak out. Got it. And by the way, if you screw up, we won't be correcting you, okay? Though my guess is three is this. No. Aha, see, right, yeah, ha-ha. Well done, excellent. All right, so let's start off going up in English. Oh, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Wheels on a big rig and they're rolling, rolling, rolling. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Count them backwards. There's 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Wheels on a big rig and they're rolling, 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 rolling. Go up by two. There's two. 18. Wheels on a big rig and they're rolling, 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 rolling. Odd numbers only. There's one. Three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen. Wheels on a big rig and they're rolling, 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 rolling. Take you back to grade nine French. We got un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, six, sept, huit, neuf, dix, on, deux, treize, quatorze, quinze, dix, sept, dix, sept, dix, huit. Wheels on a big rig and they're rolling, 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 rolling. In Hindi, we have. Wheels on a big rig and they're. In sign language, we have? 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Wheels on a big rig, and they're. In Kurdish, we have? Wheels on a big rig, and they're. What language again? Punjabi. In Punjabi we got? Ik do, 
तीन चार पाँच छः सात आठ नौ दस ग्यारह बारह तेरह चौदह पंद्रह सोलह सतारह अठारह वीज ऑन बिग रिंग इन दर खुजरारी वी गैट Wheels on a big ring, Edna. In Roman numerals, got I I I I I I I V V V I V I I I X X X I X X S I X I V X V X V I X V I I X V I I I wheels on a big ring, Edna. The world is at Conestoga College. Give our volunteers a nice round of applause. Gonna get a selfie with you guys. Gonna get a selfie with you guys. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Awesome. Have a seat, everybody. I'll do a quick selfie with the world here. And okay. okay uh, that's nice. Nice. Thank you so much. Thank you for volunteering. Thank you. Thank you. That one almost four years ago. Welcome back, everybody. There's three great rewards, including more of you in your talk, more self-disclosure, more I and my, weaving it into who you are as a person. First, reaction and audience. When your audience feels they can relate and that you're inspiring and that your honesty helps open their doors to their honesty, you're well on your way. That key word there, relate, is the key to any good talk in any sort of way. The second reward of including more self-disclosure comes from this very quick story. I'm walking to Mr. Friday's grade nine geography class. And I said to the guys, come on man, hurry up. I wanna get to geography class. And one of my buddies, Kay, says, oh, I hate geography. Ah, oh, and just without even thinking, I said, oh man, I love geography. Come on, let's get going. And he seemed surprised. You like geography? Yeah. Oh man, oh, uh, geography's so boring. And that's where you have those moments in life, right? Somebody you like has a very different opinion on something that you like. And you now cover that up, restrict who you are, or you, as a 14-year-old in this case, keep going with it. Well, I don't know. I really like geography. I think Mr. Friday is a good teacher. What? <laughs> Isn't weird? I don't like Mr. Friday at all, my buddy said. Oh, I, I, I like him. You ever encountered that where somebody that you like doesn't really like somebody that you in turn really like? Whether it's a type of music, a teacher, a boss? Oh, you don't like, oh, oh yeah, they did this. Well, I don't know. I see it from a different opinion, right? The second reward of sharing who you are is you increase your self-knowledge. The more you talk about what you like, don't like, what's important to you, what you're passionate about, the more you share it, the more you hit your heart, hit your brain going, yeah, that's who I am. If I'm confident enough to share it, this is who I am. And the more you talk about it, the more you make better decisions on what you truly like and or don't like. I like geography. In grade 10, God, I like history. Doing the homework for history is not homework. I'm enjoying it. Late grade 11, what do you want to major in university? Geography and history. I will now take grade 12 and 13 courses that will point me in my direction. The more I share what I like, the more I get pointed in a direction to a lifestyle and a career and a life of what I like. And some of you have been there. Maybe you've been there personally. You restricted sharing what you like, made some choices to keep other people happy, have gained in confidence and stopped, whoa, whoa, time out. I'm gonna go in a different direction because this is what I truly want to do, right? Share. And I'm not saying we all get that dream job getting to be the artist or motivational speaker. Being an artist or motivational speaker might complement what you do. I mentioned this morning that my father-in-law was a computer engineer. 
but complemented that with getting the training and the leadership training to run monthly motivational leadership sessions, running team building sessions. So he, had, he was both a motivational speaker within his company and a computer programmer but also a singer-songwriter and would share that with his church. So there's other ways you can share your passion and who you are rather than strictly getting a nine to five type of career with it. The more you share who you are, you increase your self-knowledge. I must be able to tell you who I am before I know who I am. I must be able to tell you who I am before I know who I am and then something happens. You make decisions that are best for you. There's nothing wrong with being flexible. I saw my second favorite band of all time last summer. The band's called Iron Maiden. And I read somewhere, and it's a good point, Iron Maiden is the world's most popular band that nobody knows a lot of their songs. They are literally the world's most popular band without a single radio hit. Even Black Sabbath says Paranoid, and even 50-year-olds know Hotline Bling by Drake, and nothing else. But Iron Man has, if you, you either know everything about Iron Man or nothing. And then you find out they sold out the Rogers Center. But it's not my wife's music. <laughs> it is not my wife's music. Like I literally showed her video of my two favorite songs and her little statement was, did you just play the same song twice? <laughs> she thought it was the same song. I no, that's Hallowed by Thy Name and that's the Trooper. No? Oh. Well, I can see it's got, oh, forget it. In other words, I will play Iron Maiden when they're not at home. I will play a, ref a mix of today's hits and Shania Twain for when they're around. Don't be stupid. You know I love you. Don't be absurd. It's, it's Shania Twain to my friends from the continent. Be who you are at the same time you have to accommodate. Finally, the third and maybe the most powerful reward of more self-disclosure is a shift in attitude. Chappelle, three days ago when I watched his 2017 special again, when he admitted to the crowd, before I came out, I thought I was going to be great. Imagine if you thought the same way every time you gave your opinion. You see too many people get up in front of anybody one-on-one. -on -one. So can I call you sometime? Right? One-on-one. -on -one. So do you want to buy this? Or in front of a classroom. And they get up and they think, I'm not good enough. But when you include more self-disclosure, you constantly challenge yourself to be who you are. You drop the nut and you start thinking, I'm good enough. I'm good enough. I'm good enough. That is an amazing shift in attitude. It changes how you write. It changes how you talk. It changes the type of people that gravitate towards you. If you're constantly beating yourself up inside, let alone verbally, and it's easy to do that. You know, some, days, some days we have bad days. It's not easy when you do 65 to 70% of your work in Ontario schools and that business is down 95% in the last few months. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Nobody is hiring right now. There's two strikes next week. Right? This is a weird year for your friend, the motivational speakers who work in schools. Yet, do I swirl in self pity and negativity? Is that going to get me ahead? Did that help Nav in 84? No. So, even the motivational speaker needs to hear some motivation. I'm good enough. We'll get through this. We'll get through this. Look at my wife who walked the pickets on Tuesday as a French teacher. We'll get through this. So my time with you starts to end. And we talk about the power of self-disclosure. I, my, your opinion, your story, you're good enough. Why should you do this? Why should you reclaim what you were like in grade two? Happy, sad, frustrated, angry. 
with that level of maturity where you know how to share it. Why should you do this? Because the reaction in audience. Because what happens when you share you, you walk with more self-confidence about who you are and self-knowledge. And finally, you walk with an amazing shift in attitude. And then you can bring a conclusion to some of your stories. You can tell your audience that what helped save you as a 14 year old was a letter. Coach Don Young came out of Hamilton in the late 50s. He was the second fastest man in Canada in 1960. But in the only time in Canadian history, for some reason, they only decided to send one 100 meter runner to the Tokyo Olympics. So Coach Don Young at Laurier Secondary School missed the Olympics by just a few milliseconds. As a highly recruited football and track and field star, he knew what it felt like to be recruited to get letters as a grade 12. We want you, we want you, we want you. Would that feel good? But he decided to stay at McMaster University there in Hamilton, where he played football, did track and field, got his education degree, and begins his teaching career. And like any new teachers, he's excited, he's enthusiastic, I'm gonna change the world, I'm gonna do track and field. But one of his first challenges he ran into as a young track and field coach was just getting kids show up to practice, to tryouts, and interacting with some of these kids who walked by in the hallway, yeah, I'll be there, coach, and then they didn't. So he had the courage to say, why not? He started hearing the words like, not good enough. I'm not going to make it. I don't want to get cut. Think about how cutting edge he was in the 60s when he started to think, well, why do I call them potential tests? Think about it. In track and field, I really don't have cuts. Why don't I find out what you're good at and call them potential tests? And why don't I say, I know there is no cuts. As long as you go to practice and you help fundraise, you're on the team. And why don't I create recruitment letters for grade nines? Where do you get your list of kids from? I'll call every feeder school and give me the list of their soccer players. No, soccer players will conflict. Well, I'll still take soccer players, cross country, and track and field from the previous year and send them all a letter. January? No, that's too late. October. I'll do that before it gets busy. October. And we'll start the season in January. But track and field really doesn't start to April. Well, we can do an indoor track and field season. That's how we get good. One month after the skinny white kid got cut from football on October 22nd, 1984. And those of you who saw my reliability workshop, he spelled my name right. <laughs> right? What a great man. Homeroom. And everything you see in marker was his handwriting. I will send personalized letters and recruit grade nines for potential tests, clearly outlining when my potential test is, because I'm in grade nine, signing it, potential tests are held in the halls. Mr. Young had no idea how much I needed that letter the second month of grade nine. A few weeks after getting cut from football, a few weeks after not having the courage to join student council. That letter changed my life. That man changed my life. That's me at my first track and field meet. My dad took that picture at Western University, which I toured with my eldest niece on Thursday. The facility doesn't look like that anymore. It looks a lot better. There I am on the track and field team. Oh, sorry. Where am I again? Right there. Track and field was about fun and friends. When was your first ribbon, Andy? Grade 9? Nope. Grade 10? Nope. Grade 11? Yep. First, second? Nope. Fifth? Yep. That's the white ribbon, by the way, folks. 
It wasn't about winning because I wasn't at first. It was about Andre, who I was hanging out with yesterday. It was about Ozzy, PJ, Christine, Sandra. It was the people. Out of the five guys in my wedding party when I got married in 1998, three I met through track and field. It was white sitting beside black, sitting beside Lebanese. It was track and field trips to Kitchener at the stadium, a Seagram Stadium, right? Centennial. Centennial Stadium. Or going to the power relays there, Michael Power in Etobicoke. It was getting fifth or getting second by grade 13. Five team titles. Friends who become brothers. Lining up now in the front with confidence, but still being jokers as both PJ and Steve stuffed their pants, those goofy guys. <laughs> still laugh about that to this day. Three socks, man, they put three socks in there. What idiots. Now you can't look, sorry, I know. <laughs> I made the senior football team twice. Twice. Why? Because there's no cuts in senior football. And they needed somebody to hit in practice. Why not hit me? Probably be better to go with the Lawrence Cousins. <laughs> The shy guy who didn't have the confidence to try out or go to a student council meeting in grade nine did have the confidence in grade 12 where I met a guy named Stu. We decided to run a leadership conference together. Decided to run for student council executive together. And by grade 13, Much Music named as the most spirited school in Canada. And I'm leading pep rallies where I'm holding people's attention. It was Stu who gave me a call in 1991. I volunteered to speak at a conference for all the London area schools. They gave me 90 minutes to talk. Andy, I know you're a welcome week leader at Western. Andy, I already know that you do free talks every spring to the grade eights at Feeder High School. Can you do this speech with me, man? Just once, we'll never do it again. Sure. And we put together a workshop on how to improve your student council. And Andy and Stu got on stage December 12th, we think it was, 1991. And afterwards, three schools came up to us. Wow, you guys are great. How much do you cost? You want to speak at our school? And I had to whisper to Stu, Stu, how much do we cost, man? <laughs> do you know how they paid me for my first speech in December of 91? 20 pack of Timbit donuts. <laughs> and three of them were planes that don't even count. Why have a plain Timbit, right? What's the point of the plain one? At least give me the Dutchie, right? The chocolate covered. So 17 Timbits. And then I had to split that with Stu. Eight and a half tin bits is how I got paid for my first talk. And 28 years later, after that first paid talk in 1992, I'm still going. Are you ready for this, folks? I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for some key steps along the way, like the letter, like the encouragement of my former student council advisor, like Stu, but through it all, I give you my story. Go share yours. The reaction in the audience, your increased self-knowledge, and the massive shift in attitude will change everything for you. Thank you so much for giving up your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay, so once again, let's give a big thank you for Andy for coming here and talking to us. Thank you. Great. So now we're going to head back to the blue room. We're going to have a quick short break and then we're going to stay there for the big main session at 2.45, okay? All good? Woo! Woo!
Thanks everybody, I'm an email, phone call away, any other insights can help you out. And off the video tabs are some of my favorite icebreakers, including 18 Wheels and a Big Rig, Ua Orchestra, Dexterity Check, and others, all at the video tab off of my website, which you saw there. My Instagram, I share uh, my thoughts on uh, music, and my, my favorite piece called Mascot of the Week. Okay. Some of my favorite stories about the different mascots I encounter. Last week was the Debden Frogs. Yes, folks, it's because it was a French community, but just like Nav, they decided, you know what, they're going to make call French people frogs, we're going to embrace it, and they made their mascot the frogs. Thanks everybody for being awesome, that was great.